things and buy things and. Well, my mom's mom just thinks fast and tells us to go to our room. Always looking around to see, you know, uh, if the camp was looking good for inspection. He caught the spirit of that. He's so quiet. I used to refer to him as the inscrutable Oriental. He's what others have mentioned tonight, an entrepreneur. He, uh, it's uh, amazing the things he's come up with. He's a reserved individual. However, he's still mischievous, just like the rest of them. And well, he rode to Provo and back on his bike. I'm very proud of him, that he stayed with it. He's a bit Huck Finn and uh, a little bit of, uh, of Tom Edison, I guess, and some of the things that he likes to do, and uh, he's quiet. Tonight, Sunday, November 20th, 1988, we are gathered as family and friends to honor you, John Freer, in the presentation of your Eagle Award. You now belong to a sacred brotherhood that only 2% of the young men in the Boy Scouts of America ever achieve. Your life and the lives of many around you will be affected positively because of your efforts in reaching this goal. We dedicate this night to you. John Furrier, to me, has always represented the example of a nice guy who can finish first. Uh, John has earned my respect by simply going out and achieving things, accomplishing things, without a great deal of fanfare. He doesn't, he tries to avoid the limelight, tries to avoid public attention. In fact, I'm sure that this whole proceeding tonight is somewhat of an embarrassment to him. But in that regard, the world needs more people like John. Uh, there are a lot of us who do a song and dance and don't accomplish very much. And John is one of those people who will, who will not s make a great deal of noise about himself, but who over time, I think, will uh, accomplish great things. And certainly, achieving the rank of Eagle is an impressive achievement, particularly for those of us who didn't make it. Took his mother's canned fruit and put it in a coaster wagon and took it all around the neighborhood and sold his mother's canned fruit. <laughs> so the next summer she made him help her can so he could uh, see how, what a chore and what a job it was to can fruit. Did he make good money? Well, he, he thought he did. Sometimes he teases, but one time he helped me when I was sick and he bought me chocolate milk and a candy bar. Really? How'd that make you feel? Good. But it sort of made me feel sick. <laughs> <laughs> Always looking around to see, you know, uh, if the camp was looking good for inspection. He caught the spirit of that. And uh, I think through his efforts, encouraging other boys to help out to uh, make sure that all the pots, pans, silverware were put in place. No litter around. We passed inspection every morning, and we got honored. That was our first camp, I think, if that ever happened, uh, thanks to John. We took our traditional night hike up the mountain in the middle of the night, and as luck would have it, several of the boys got separated from the rest and uh, got lost on the mountaintop. And they followed their scouting training and stayed put where they, where they became separated, used the flashlight to signal for some help, and several hours later when they were located and rescued. The other boys involved were uh, rather tearful and emotional about the whole episode, but John was calm and collected and inscrutable, and one couldn't tell whether he was frightened by the experience or not. He seemed to not move him at all. He was just totally calm about it. And the very next night, several of them uh, left the camp and, and slept alone on it, or attempted to sleep alone on the mountainside uh, even after that ordeal. But I remember trying to figure what John was thinking, how that affected him, how he reacted to that experience. 
He was very calm and collected, and to this day I don't know if he was frightened about it or not, but I know the other boys were. <laughs> I'll never forget when John, I guess he spotted me as a, as a worthy customer. He came walking down the street with a, a rabbit in a cage, and uh, I'm going, oh, no, what am I going to do now? How am I going to talk him out of not selling me this rabbit? Because I knew what he was up to. It wasn't but uh, five minutes later that I had a rabbit in a cage in my house, and uh, he did an awful good sales job. I still remember one time when we took these young boys down to the swimming pool to pass off a swimming merit badge. And uh, we dang near, uh, you know, they were drowning, uh, trying to pass off half of that stuff. And I, I caught half of them trying to cheat, you know, not count their laps correctly and things. And, and I think John, in fact, I know John was one of the last ones finishing, he and Matt Clegg. I think you're ahead of Matt Clegg, I can't remember. but, but. Uh, it got right down to the end, and I think John was the very last one to finish. But when he finished, I knew that he had counted every one of his laps. Where some of these, I still had a question in my mind, so I'd make him go three or four more times just so I'd make sure they had done them all. And uh, and so he's, you know, he's a trustworthy person, and uh, it doesn't matter to him if he finishes last. But when he's finished, you know he's done it right. Let's see, one time he was selling fool's gold, and he. He was walking around the block, and he made me start yelling, like, fool's gold for sale and everything. <laughs> well, I really didn't want to. <laughs> Did you make good money? No. Another time I was in the kitchen, and um, just busy doing dishes, and I noticed that the neighborhood kids were coming in very quietly and going downstairs. And then a few minutes later, they'd reappear with these little brown bags and walk out the door. And uh, I thought, gee, I wonder what they're doing. They're so quiet. Uh, and I went down. To, my curiosity got the best of me. And I see a whole line of kids in front of John's bedroom door. Above his door is the sign, John's General Store. And I go in, and on his bed, are all of his little trinkets and doodads that he had for the longest time that he decided he could make money on. And he had price tags on each one. And he was busily typing up receipts for each one of the kids that bought something. And they'd quietly buy and they'd leave. And I guess he made a killing that day, too. <laughs> he had a big imagination about this flying machine that he was going to build. And I think he did get one of the neighbor boys to be the goat and put him on his chair and tied him up to this flying machine. But it didn't work, so the kid said, no, and I'll never do that again. Uh, another thing that he would do with bugs is he'd put them in little jars and put them in the freezer to, uh, to put them in a false sense of hibernation. And then, oh, maybe an hour or so later, he'd see if they'd come too. And then he would lengthen the, their stay in the freezer just to see how long they could stay in there before they'd, they'd croak. <laughs> Another time, he got a drawer, put it on the steps out there, and then used his mother's dishwasher, water soap, and soaked it all over, and then he let the kids get on it and slide down, and he charged them so much for sliding down the store. <laughs> It's an honor for me uh, realizing that uh, John is actually the very first uh, in the Freer family to have ever obtained the rank of the Eagle Scout, and uh, I never did. Uh, as I, you know, as I look back, uh, as I attend court, you know, courts of honor, uh, it, I, you know, I regret not having, you know, put forth that extra effort, and I'm, I'm very, very proud that John has put forth that extra effort. I'm grateful to his mother that's uh, been uh, you know, such an unrelenting influence in, in uh, accomplishing and reaching that goal. But, uh, I want him to know that I'm proud and, and uh, he's beginning a, a tradition in our family that I hope will, will last for many generations. <laughs>